Welcome back. In the last lecture, we discussed the constitutional and statutory protections for phone wiretaps. This lecture covers requests from law enforcement for historical call records and account information. In other words, roughly, what would appear on a person's telephone bill? It would include your name and address, for example, as well as a list of numbers you connected to, whether the call was incoming or outgoing, the time the call started, and how long the call lasted. Here's a tiny example from my own call records. And in case you're curious, it's Chinese takeout lunch. We're going to revisit the sensitivity of call records in the context of National Security Agency surveillance. All right, so that's the sort of information we're talking about. You might hear these records referred to as local usage details, or LUDs. They are also sometimes referred to as call detail records, or CDRs. Both mean the same thing, a list of calls. I would like to cover three topics about this information. First, the third party doctrine. It's the Fourth Amendment doctrine that governs call records and account information. Second, the Stored Communications Act. It's the federal statutory scheme that covers this information. Third, I'll very briefly mention how law enforcement agencies get this information in practice. So, let's turn to the third party doctrine and how it fits into the Fourth Amendment. When discussing search and seizure warrants, we looked at the structure of the Fourth Amendment, and we saw that there are, at a high level, two questions to answer. Was there a search or seizure? And was it reasonable? We also touched on how, historically, the Supreme Court's approach to government privacy was fairly binary. In one category, the court would classify a practice as a search or a seizure and impose all of the default warrant, probable cause, and particularity requirements. In the other category, the court would classify a practice as neither a search nor a seizure and impose no Fourth Amendment requirements. The modern trend at the Supreme Court is to define new categories under the Fourth Amendment which don't get all the warrant protections, but do get some protection. The third party doctrine is very much a creation of the old approach, in which many practices were ruled totally exempt from the Fourth Amendment. The rough idea is that information volunteered to a third party is exempt from Fourth Amendment protection. The early cases in the third party doctrine involved informants. The Supreme Court held consistently that disclosures to informants were not covered by the Fourth Amendment. It didn't matter if the informant was a police officer or even a private citizen. It also didn't matter if the conversation was recalled or even recorded. So long as the conversation was voluntary, there was no constitutional issue. Those are the early cases. The court then extended the doctrine, in later cases, to written business records. The Supreme Court expressly held that a person's financial records and a person's phone records are outside the scope of the Fourth Amendment. They get no protection. Consequently, they can be accessed with just a subpoena to the bank or to the phone company. Now, the legal rationale for the third party doctrine is deeply ambiguous. Courts and scholars aren't in alignment. So, let me give a few common theories. One theory is that volunteering information to a third party eliminates a reasonable expectation of privacy. Courts sometimes base this view on the notion that a human phone operator is like a human informant. And since human informants aren't covered by the Fourth Amendment, neither are human operators. Of course, the immediate rebuttal to this point, and the reason it isn't much emphasized now, 
is that we don't use human phone operators anymore. So, okay, the human informant analogy breaks down fairly quickly. Another reason why privacy expectations are diminished, courts have held, is that ordinary people know their telephone company collects this information. There's an important caveat, though. Telephone companies also collect the contents of voice calls for purposes of passing them along to the other end. The companies also often listen in and make recordings to check call quality. So, the narrower version of this rationale is that the Fourth Amendment applies where a communications company is acting as a conduit. It doesn't apply where a communications company is the end destination for some information. This is, I think it's fair to say, the most commonly emphasized legal argument in favor of the third party doctrine. To a large extent, it raises more questions than it answers. Why does a privacy expectation cease to be reasonable just because some information sits in a corporate database? And why is a company acting as a conduit so different from a company acting as a recipient? Anyway, there's the expectation of privacy argument. A second high-level legal argument for the third-party doctrine has been assumption of the risk. The idea is that when a person shares information with a phone company, they run the risk of the phone company giving out that information. But that's just a circular argument. A person runs the risk of their phone company sharing information with the government if and only if the law allows that sharing. So, assumption of the risk is a rationale that does get invoked for the third-party doctrine, but it's really more of a consequence of the doctrine. There are a couple other rationales that have been advanced for the doctrine, more in policy and politics settings than in legal writing. One is that the data covered by the third-party doctrine isn't particularly sensitive. This information, the argument goes, isn't nearly as big a deal as the content of communications. And call records consist of numbers, not names. When we turn to the National Security Agency's phone metadata monitoring, I'll talk about how these views don't seem to hold up. Another rationale is that the third-party doctrine allows government access to information that was previously public. Put differently, before the rise of electronic communications, most interactions were in public, where the government could observe. The third-party doctrine is a way of accommodating that historical capability. Of course, it's easy to quibble with historical practice as a justification, and interactions using modern communications technology sure don't look much like the public square. But, okay. There are the rationales for the doctrine. There is a tremendous amount of policy and legal criticism directed towards the doctrine, and it's begun to fall into disfavor. One line of attack is that the doctrine artificially makes government privacy an all-or-nothing deal. But why should that be the case? In particular, we don't expect our phone company to share our account information or call records with just anyone who asks? Also, statutory privacy isn't binary. Many statutory schemes, including ECBA, as we'll soon see, have in-between categories. Similarly, state constitutional privacy isn't necessarily binary. Quite a few state courts have interpreted their state constitution to reject the third-party doctrine. Finally, privacy isn't just about maintaining secrecy. There are quite a few reasons to protect individual privacy against the government, including risks of information misuse and chilling effects. Another high-level concern is information asymmetry. Ordinary folks just aren't aware of most data they generate. If the basis for the third-party doctrine is voluntarily sharing information, it seems like maybe it shouldn't apply 
to a lot of information technology. Yet another objection is that there are social and commercial pressures at play. There are all sorts of reasons to use email and social networking, for example. Why should government investigators get a surveillance windfall from the necessities of modern life? Last, the data covered by the third-party doctrine can be very sensitive. It entrusts an awful lot of information to government investigators without requiring much evidence in advance. So, those are some of the common criticisms of the third-party doctrine. Since the rationale for the third-party doctrine is so ambiguous, the breadth of the doctrine is also very ambiguous. Courts ultimately have to draw a line. On one side is information that goes unprotected because of the third-party doctrine. On the other is information that remains protected by the Fourth Amendment. Courts strain mightily to determine what's unprotected and what is protected. Rulings are somewhat inconsistent and often read as far removed from the original rationales for the doctrine. In the unprotected category, courts have placed account information. They've also placed communications metadata, information about communications, but not the content of the communications. Courts have especially tied themselves in knots when trying to fashion a test for metadata and trying to determine what's in the category. The last entry in the unprotected column is content voluntarily conveyed to a business, where the business is the intended recipient. So, for example, a message you save. In the protected column, as we saw, is content where the business is merely a conduit. Courts have been slowly moving the category of content shared with a business from the unprotected column over to the protected column. We'll talk about that more in the context of email. All right, that's enough for now on the mess that is the third-party doctrine. Now let's turn to the Stored Communications Act, which is the statutory scheme that governs account information and historical call records. In 1986, Congress totally overhauled U.S. communications privacy law. For reference, it's the same year that Dionne Warwick and Lionel Richie and Mr. Mister were topping the charts. The new statutory scheme was called the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, or ECPA for short. ECPA has three major parts. First up is the Wiretap Act. It's the same Wiretap Act we saw earlier. That part of ECPA deals with prospective collection of communications content. The second part of ECPA is the Stored Communications Act, or SCA. It addresses retrospective collection of content and metadata and account information. The last part of ECPA is the Pen Register Act. It deals with prospective collection of communications metadata. Since we're dealing with account information and retrospective call metadata, we're dealing with the Stored Communications Act. And in fact, there's a specific statutory provision within the SCA that addresses these categories of information. It's not too difficult to read. The provision says that a provider of a communication service shall disclose to a governmental entity the, and then it lists some categories of information, and then says, of a customer of such service, when served with an investigative subpoena. So, fairly straightforward. The list of information includes exactly what we've been talking about. Account information, like a name and address, as well as call records. So, the statute's pretty clear. Part of the same statute also deals with notice. It says, simply, 
that notice isn't required. So, there's what the SCA has to say about provider subpoenas. Now let me touch on how these work in practice. Law enforcement serves a telephone company with a subpoena, and the telephone company sends back account information and call records. As a rough benchmark, Verizon and AT&T in 2013 received about a quarter million government subpoenas. The provider subpoena is unambiguously the most popular surveillance technique. And that shouldn't come as too much of a surprise. The subpoena is the easiest form of surveillance procedure. All right, that's all I wanted to say about provider subpoenas in practice. Once again, for review, I've prepared a handy table to keep track of surveillance orders. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about pen registers and trap and trace devices. They allow for prospective surveillance of communications and metadata.